This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, editor of the Breakthroughs newsletter. Today, we're talking about the topic of autism spectrum disorder. One in 68 children has some form of autism spectrum disorder. The number of cases has spiked in recent years. The new Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment at Feinberg is focused on understanding the biological basis of autism and related neurodevelopment disorders and using this knowledge to develop treatments. My name is Peter Pensas. I'm a professor at Northwestern University, and I'm the director of the Northwestern Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment. Thank you so much for joining me. So if you could give me a little background about yourself, where did you study and how did you find your way to Northwestern? Yeah, so I grew up in Romania, in Transylvania, and I uh, studied biochemistry there. And then I came to the U.S. to do my Ph.D. also in biochemistry. Then I continued uh, to study neuroscience because it was a very fascinating field to me. And within neuroscience, I uh, studied synapses, which are the the connections between brain cells. Fifteen years ago, I uh, got an offer at Northwestern And I joined the faculty here, and I became an assistant professor, and I've been here at Northwestern since 2003. Can you talk a little bit about um, some of the struggles that people face who are diagnosed with autism? Yes, so uh, autism as a condition comes uh, very often associated with other problems, such as seizures, epilepsy, intellectual disability, which is present in about 50% or 70% of uh, children with autism, gastrointestinal symptoms, aggression, difficulty to eat, difficulty to sleep, um, many other uh, problems that are behavioral, but not only behavioral, that make um, uh, care for uh, these children very, very difficult. So this brand new Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment here at Feinberg is focused on, like you said, understanding the biological basis of autism and other neurodevelopment disorders, and then developing new treatments. So how is basic science crucial to understanding and treating autism? One of the main goals of the center is to understand what the uh, normal functions of these genes that have been implicated in autism are in the brain and what mutations in these genes do to brain circuits during development. And what we learned is that not all this genetic uh, uh, risk is inherited. Many are the so-called de novo mutations which occur in uh, the parent and are transmitted to the child. We also learned that probably hundreds or maybe even thousands of genes contribute to autism, but uh, they contribute in a very complicated way. Some of these genes, uh, when they have some severe mutations, they cause autism in those specific patients. But these are rare uh, mutations, and uh, they, might cause, uh, muta- they might cause autism in uh, a handful of patients. On the other hand of the um, genetic spectrum are common variants, so-called common variants, uh, which have a very small effect size. So they only increase risk of autism by 20%. But when many of these line up, uh, that may lead to autism. And in the middle are uh, other types of variations called copy number variations in which several genes are deleted or duplicated. And those uh, types of mutation increase risk of autism by 10 or 20-fold. So this is something that people who are diagnosed with autism or parents of children who are diagnosed may be interested in knowing more. Do you talk to parents sometimes who want to know more about sort of that basic science, the genetic information about what has caused autism in in me or my child? We actually want this to be one of the main goals of uh, the Autism Center at Northwestern. We want uh, to educate the public about uh, what uh, what the different genetic mutations mean. What they, uh, how they can uh, be used to inform treatments. And also, um, we, we, use, we would like to use this information to develop better treatments that are more suited to individual patients. So the, the personalized medicine approach is something that is a dream for you uh, when it comes to treating autism someday. Yes, exactly, Uh, because um, autism is a spectrum disorder, which actually means that no two children with autism are alike. 
So their genetic mutations, their environmental contribution are all different. So clinical trials and development of new drugs for autism have been really made difficult because of this heterogeneity. So one approach that has been used in some other diseases in the past is to group patients based on mutations as opposed to symptoms. And uh, when you group them based on mutations, you can uh, develop or repurpose known drugs that treat that specific gene or mutation, not the symptoms. So this is what we, uh, one of the goals uh, of the center is to identify patients that have mutations in a specific genetic pathway, group them into a study, a so-called basket trial, and uh, try to repurpose drugs from other um, diseases or uh, to develop new drugs for these subgroups of patients. Right now, when someone is diagnosed with autism, are they given a genetic test? Do they know which mutations they have of certain genes? There is not uh, sequencing. Uh, the DNA of uh, each patient is not part of um, the current standard of care in autism, but it is, for example, for pediatric epilepsies. So one of the goals of the center is to expand this and include uh, all autistic children that are seen at Northwestern in the sequencing program, um, and uh, that will help us first group patients based on these uh, genetic subgroups and uh, will help us guide individualized treatments for these children. So you said one of the major goals of the center is to help develop treatments using existing drugs um, to treat autism. How far away are we from clinical trials for treatments uh, for autism and related diseases? In fact, there are uh, several hundred clinical trials going on right now, uh, mostly from uh, academic centers. Uh, Most of those trials are based on uh, repurposing existing drugs. But there are many difficulties with uh, these type of trials, and often they fail because of the genetic heterogeneity of autism. Uh, Some patients could respond very well to a drug, but other patients don't because they have a different genetic makeup. So when you mix them all together, it looks like the drug is not working. So what we would like to do is start from the genetics. It's called genetics first approach, not from the symptoms. And based on that, group patients, based on their genetic mutations and knowing, uh, understanding better these functional pathways that are affected in uh, the patients, we could, um, we could use existing drugs that target that specifically that pathway. And right now, what, what are parents to do or caretakers to do for someone diagnosed with autism? What's sort of the treatment right now? The current uh, treatment, on one hand, addresses some of these uh, comorbidities, for example, epilepsy or aggression or depression, anxiety, uh, sometimes with medication. On the other hand, there are psychosocial interventions, which seem fairly effective, but they are extremely work-intensive and uh, may require full-time specialists to work one-on-one with a child. You mentioned that there's genetic mutations and genes that contribute to autism, and there's also some environmental factors. Can you talk a little bit about that? There's a lot of um, there's a lot out there in the media, um, on social media, about autism and environment. What do we know? Certain environmental uh, conditions uh, are thought to contribute to autism. For example, uh, maternal infection during pregnancy or uh, specific medications taken by uh, the mother during pregnancy or drugs or chemical exposures uh, increase risk for autism. There has been a lot of uh, hype and scare about uh, vaccines causing autism, but I would like to emphasize that that has been shown repeatedly not to be the case. So uh, it is now very clear that vaccines do not cause autism. When you talk about that autism is genetic or highly genetic, would you say 70 to... 80% 80% to 80, 90%. 90%. Um, but a lot of this is the de novo, uh, first, the first time, like they, they didn't inherit it from their parents. Is that correct? Um, yes. They, um, in many cases, uh, the mutations occur in uh, the germline cells of uh, the parents, in particular in fathers. Uh, so uh, 
it, it has been shown that older fathers have a higher risk of having such mutations. So autism has actually been associated with um, an older age of the father, not of the mother. So uh, that means that mutations can occur in the sperm and be transmitted to children. So it's a genetic mutation, but it's not inherited through many generations. Very interesting. And boys are oftentimes diagnosed with autism disorder more often than girls. Why is that? Uh, yes, it's not very cl uh, clear why, but the ratio seems to be four to one boys to girls. Um, the reasons might be complicated. that have been uh, suggested that girls are maybe underdiagnosed. So um, maybe more girls uh, have autism than are currently diagnosed. Also, when you include other factors in the diagnosis, such as uh, intellectual disability, the ratio could change to two to one. So the center is brand new. You have about 25 members so far. What are some of the different projects that are taking place at the center right now? There are several uh, interesting uh, lines of research. In uh, several labs are studying so-called mouse models of autism. So in mice, we can study brain circuits because, because we can do experiments on, on them. So we make these mutated genetic mutations in mice, which uh, replicate the mutations that happen in uh, patients, in human patients with autism. And then we can study these mice, and what we learn from the mice, we extrapolate to patients so we better understand what's going on in their brains. So several labs in the center are involved in studying these so-called autism mouse models. Other laboratories are studying human brain cells that are grown in a dish. This, this is a new technology uh, that is very revolutionary, and it allows uh, scientists to study brain cells uh, from the actual patient. And the way this is done is cells from a blood sample, blood cells, can be made into brain cells in special conditions in a dish. And then we can study these cells uh, uh, that model, that replicate the brain cells of the patient. So these cells have uh, the specific mutation that a patient carries, and these cells can be used to understand specifically the disease of that patient or that patient group, and it can also be used to develop drugs specifically tailored for that patient group. So there's also this overlap between autism and epilepsy that you mentioned before. You have people in the center who are really looking closely at this. Tell me about that. Yes, that is a major focus of the center because um, about 30 to 50 percent of children with autism also have seizures or epilepsy. And uh, at Northwestern, there is a very strong group of epilepsy scientists and uh, clinicians. And uh, many of the patients they see for epilepsy actually turn out to be uh, to also have autism. Uh, many genes that cause epilepsy also cause autism and vice versa. So we think that by understanding uh, the genetic and neurobiological causes of this childhood uh, epilepsy, uh, we can also understand the biology of autism and by um, potentially repurposing drugs that treat ion channel dysfunction or, or seizures, we could potentially address uh, the behavioral symptoms of uh, children with autism. Well, the goal of the center is really basic science and how you can use basic science to understand autism and hopefully one day create treatments. You're also teaming up with organizations such as Autism Speaks for a seminar sp series. Tell me a little bit about the relationship between the center and an outreach group like Autism Speaks. Why is it important to have these relationships with outside groups, and what are some of the activities you have planned? Uh, yeah, so we are running a seminar series uh, about once a month uh, to which we invited world-renowned scientists in the field of autism. And uh, we will make these seminars public, so the public is invited to attend. And the goal is really keep everybody up to date with the newest developments in autism. And we, these seminars will be followed by receptions where uh, interested uh, families could meet in person the members of the Autism Center and also the speakers. We also teamed up with Autism Speaks and we'll have an Autism uh, Speaks town hall uh, meeting at uh, Northwestern. And um, 
those town hall meetings are organized several times a year uh, and uh, offer the opportunity, uh, again, to uh, families of uh, patients with autism to learn about new standards of care and uh, be in touch with the community of uh, uh, parents uh, in, in the whole country. We will have the uh, director of uh, Autism Speaks as one of the guests in our center, and he will give a public talk sometime in April. You can learn more about Dr. Penza's research and read the full article online at feinberg.northwestern.edu slash breakthroughs. I'm Erin Spain, editor of the Breakthroughs Newsletter. Thanks for listening. <laughs>